Hi everybody, it's Peter Schiff. It is Friday, February 4th, 2011. Well, today we got the highly anticipated, as they usually are, uh, employment report for January. And it was a very uh, confusing number. First of all, the unemployment rate dropped from 9.4 to 9%. And I think the expectation was for an uptick back to 95 but on the other side of the coin, we created only 36,000 jobs during the month of January, despite a consensus estimate well north of 100,000 jobs. So the question is, if we hardly created any jobs, how is it that so many people are no longer unemployed? Well, part of the answer is that there were quite a few people who left the labor force. And so rather than getting a job, they just gave up looking. But that still doesn't really explain the whole the whole number. It's kind of a mystery to me, especially since the government went back and revised the number of jobs they created for 2010 down by 300 and some odd thousand. So we created 300 and something thousand less jobs than what the government initially told us, yet the unemployment rate is now down to 9%. Now, I say down to because that's still high. And of course, if you look at the U6, which is the unemployment which includes people who are so disgruntled that they're no longer looking for jobs, but they certainly need them, and people who are working part-time because that's the best they can do, that's still north of 16%. But even that unemployment rate dipped a bit this month. So I think it is a very confusing number. I think maybe we'll have to wait another month. Uh, but again, no, government numbers are very unreliable anyway, even in, in, in a best case. And I think these unemployment numbers are no exception. Meanwhile, the market is not reacting too much to these numbers. I mean, the, the, the stock market is uh, uh, stronger on the day. In fact, uh, it's not a lot stronger today. The Dow is relatively quiet. But on the week, uh, the S&P and the Dow are at the highest levels they've been, I think, since August of 2008. Uh, not much action in the currency markets today, although the dollar is a bit stronger following uh, strength on Thursday. In fact, the dollar started off the week uh, very, very weak, but it rebounded on Thursday and Friday to finish relatively flat. I think that was because we had some dovish statements coming out of Germany uh, that p made people think that a German rate hike or an ECB rate hike will happen later than some people had expected. And so that weakened the euro, but that also helped set off a rally in gold. Uh, gold had been down earlier in the week, but now has reversed. And so gold and silver are now positive on the week, as are commodities in general. In fact, the CRB index is also at a new high since 2008. I think the last time the CRB was this high was in September of 2008. But the real action was in the Treasury market, uh, where the bloodbath in Treasuries continues. The yield on the the 10-year is now above 3.65%. This is the highest it's been, I think, since maybe April of last year. Uh, same with the 30-year. The 30-year yield is now north of 4.7, almost 4.74. Uh, these are the highest yields for the move, but more important than the, the level of interest rates because they're still low. It's the trajectory. It's the speed at which rates are rising. If this continues, and I think it's likely to continue, uh, you know, in a few more months, the yield on the 10-year could be 4.5%. The yield on the 30-year uh, could be 55 5.8%. And if that happens, if the yield on the 30-year in the next few months moves up close to 6%, that's going to match a 10-year high. In fact, I don't even think we've had a 6%, a 6 handle on the long bond in the last 10 years. Uh, so if the economy is in trouble now, imagine where it's going to be with a 30-year yield at a, at a decade high. Imagine uh, where mortgage rates will be with the 30-year at a decade high. So I think we are very rapidly heading for the edge of this cliff. Uh, people buying stocks on Wall Street uh, are not keeping their eyes on the road. Uh, but I do still think there's a lot of complacency. People just assume that even though rates are rising, that somehow there's a 4% ceiling on the 10-year. Uh, I don't see that ceiling. If it's there, it's made of glass, and I expect the bond market to shatter through it. And I don't think that the stock market will just shrug that off. But it's interesting that there was a press conference on yesterday, so it was on Thursday, with Ben Bernanke. And in his press conference, the Fed, uh, the Fed
stock market is rising. And I agree with the Fed chairman. The re one of the reasons or the main reason the stock market is rising is because of QE2. After all, QE2 is causing the dollar to lose purchasing power. And because the dollar is worth less, you need more dollars to buy stuff, including stocks. So prices are rising as a consequence of QE2. And some of the prices that are rising are stock prices. But the Fed chairman denied responsibility for rising commodity prices. He said that the fact that commodity prices are rising has nothing to do with quantitative easing. It's just a mere coincidence. I mean, so how could it be that he can be so sure that his monetary policy is causing stock prices to rise, but it has no effect on other prices like the price of oil or the price of wheat or the price of cotton or the price of sugar. I mean, it's completely ridiculous. The fact of the matter is stock prices and commodity prices are rising specifically because of what the Fed is doing, which is creating inflation, calling it whatever they want, QE2, but that's what it is. I thought another thing that the Fed chairman said was that he's not responsible for inflation in, in Egypt, because of course, part of the problems in Egypt, part of the reason that the Egyptian citizens are so upset and they're in the streets uh, marching is because of the rising cost of living. And people are pointing to the Fed as a part of the instigator of this through QE. And the Fed basically is pointing out, well, no, commodities are sold in, in Egyptian pounds. And the fact that prices are rising in Egyptian pounds is a function of monetary policy being too loose in Egypt that they have the tools to fight their inflation. Uh, they can uh, raise rates. They can allow their currencies to strengthen. And so it's not our fault. And basically, he's talking about the whole world as well, not just Egypt. He's saying in China, look, there's inflation in China, but it's not our fault because the Chinese have the tools to defuse that inflation. They do. Now, it is our fault because they have pegged their currency to the dollar. Now, of course, they chose to peg, but we are the currency. We have the world's reserve currency. There are a lot of benefits that come with that, and there are responsibilities. And to say that we can absolve ourselves of the inflation around the world because other central banks can abandon the dollar peg, can let the dollar tank, can start raising interest rates and allow their currency to rise is very disingenuous. And it also is very dangerous because maybe, maybe the Chinese will follow Ben Bernanke's suggestion and do something about their own inflation. We are ex exporting inflation to China, but Ben Bernanke is right. The Chinese don't have to import it. They can decide not to buy any time they want. All they have to do is let their own currency rise. But what the Fed chairman doesn't seem to understand, see, he is saying that inflation is being caused in other countries because those countries are too loose. They're creating too much money. Well, wait a minute. Well, that's what we're doing. So how can he say that inflation is being caused by central banks in other countries and they have the tools to combat it, yet somehow the rising prices here have nothing to do with what the Fed is doing? Now, I suppose what the Fed is going to say as well, you know, China and other countries have stronger economies and so they don't have all this unemployment. And so when you print money in an economy that is that's at full employment, uh, then you get rising prices or inflation. But in America, it's OK to print all this money because there's all this slack. We have all these unemployed people. Well, you know, they keep reading from this uh, Keynesian playbook even though it doesn't work. I mean, he might as well be reading from a comic book. I mean, this is all a bunch, of, a bunch of nonsense. But what will happen if countries like China do what Ben Bernanke suggests and fight their inflation by not importing ours, by letting their currency rise, by raising their interest rates, then we will have a problem. Because then all the money that, 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 that Ben Bernanke is printing to finance all these treasury purchases are going to stay in America. And then we're going to see the consequences of his monetary policy on a grander scale on commodity prices. And it will filter through to the CPI, even to the core numbers that he wants. And then what is he going to do? Is he going to continue uh, to create money? Is he going to continue to QE? And if you look at what's happening in, in, in the bond market, rates are rising because bond buyers around the world are figuring this out and they don't want to buy. That's why the Federal Reserve has just eclipsed China as the world's largest holder of U.S. Treasuries. And that's only going to get worse. Anyway, take care, everybody. Have a great weekend. I will be back again next week. Bye for now.